Most airports are equipped with giant kitchens where the food for passengers is prepared for different airlines at once. Since those oh so delightful airplane meals must be cooked about 6 to 10 hours prior to the flight, the kitchens have to work 24 7. Besides, the menu for your flight is developed up to a year in advance. This is a common practice for most airlines because every single ingredient matters and adds to expenses. In fact, American Airlines managed to save $40,000 per year in 1987 after they removed just one olive from every salad they served on their flights. If you have a long layover between flights, going to the nearest hotel to rest might not be the cheapest option. There's a much better trick. Check if the airport or airline sells 24-hour access to the VIP lounge zone. In most cases, you can have free snacks and drinks there and use free shower cabins and rooms for rest at a very affordable price. There's an actual term for the first 60 minutes after you check in, the golden hour. It's the time that passengers statistically spend more money in retail and duty-free areas of the airport. And having the most comfortable seats in those areas right in front of the shops is a clever trick to lure you in for shopping. Sitting in a comfy chair while looking at a flashy sign or shopping window can be tempting. If you ever wanted to know what happens to your baggage while you're on board a plane, the short answer is that airport staff don't know once it leaves their territory. And they probably don't really care. Sorry. Baggage is sorted automatically. Scanners scan the barcode and sort the baggage according to its destination. The three main tasks of airport baggage handlers are to move your bags from the check-in area to the gate to move them from one gate to another when you have a connection, and to move your bags from the plane to the baggage claim area. And that's it! So, if your baggage doesn't move fast enough, it can be late for your connecting flight, or the exact opposite. Your bag gets to your destination before you do because you're stuck at passport control. Another problem can arise if you forget to tear off any old stickers showing a different destination. In this case, the scanner might send your baggage to the wrong country. You arrive at the airport, already anticipating a couple weeks away from work and all your daily troubles. Park your car in the lot and then find out that it's going to cost you a small fortune to leave your car there. Why so much? In fact, airport parking lots are a business just like any other. The land on which they're built, the construction of the lot itself, the maintenance of the whole thing once it's already in operation. All that costs a handsome amount of money. And somebody's got to pay for it, of course. In addition, parking right next to an airport is simply convenient, which adds to the final cost. If you're not ready to dip into your pocket for a piece of extra comfort, better take a cab. Contrails. Those white trails airplanes often leave behind them at high altitudes are easily mistaken for engine exhaust but most are nothing more than water vapor. During a flight, moisture in the air collects in the engines before being vented with the exhaust. The hot, wet air leaving the engines mixes with the cool, dry air found at high altitudes, resulting in long, thin lines of vapor. Humidity determines when contrails form and how long they remain visible. If it's already humid up there, then there's more water and the contrail is more prominent. And if it's cold, the droplets might turn into ice, staying behind for a much longer time. If someone were able to open the door mid-flight, they would be immediately pulled out of the plane by a sudden change in air pressure. It could also do serious harm to the aircraft. Fortunately, that's almost impossible. The doors on an airliner open inward while the cabin pressure pushes them out from the inside. The difference between internal and external pressure makes it impossible for the door to open. It might seem odd that the flight crew cares whether your window shades are up or down. The main reason is so that the passenger's eyes can adjust to the outside light. Mostly, it's just a matter of getting people on and off quickly. But in an emergency, the last thing they want is people stopping to blink before they evacuate the plane. Another reason for all the shades to stay up when the airplane is about to take off or land is for the ground crew to see if there's any trouble on board. For example, if there's a fire in the cabin, 
the ground crew will immediately notice it and act accordingly. If the shades are down, they might lose precious time they would need to rescue the passengers and the airplane crew. Ever notice the numbers on the end of the runway? They're actually used to show the pilot which direction the plane is facing. For example, the number 36 is short for a heading of 360 degrees, or due north. Along with numbers, the letters R and L indicate if the nearest runway is to the right or left. Every commercial airplane you've been on has only one wing. That's right, the left and right wings are actually two parts of a single wing. The first airplanes were called biplanes because they had two wings, one on the top and the other going through the bottom of the fuselage. They were connected with struts and wires, which made a kind of box that basically allowed the aircraft not to fall apart in the air. It was necessary at lower speeds that early planes could only muster. But as the engines increased in power, the second wing became redundant. The single wing still serves as a support for the whole structure, though. Looking out the window on the plane's wing, you can see a small yellow double hook on it. It seems strange since it might mess with aerodynamics, but it's there for your safety. In case of an emergency landing, these hooks are used to secure ropes that help passengers exit the plane via the wings. If they're slippery, the rope will help you keep your footing and not fall over while going down. There are several extremely fast streams of air high up in the atmosphere of our planet. Their paths are meandering, but they have a more or less constant flow allowing passenger aircraft to use them. When an airplane comes close to a jet stream, it may adjust to the direction of its current and fly a lot faster, propelled by the flow. Many airlines use this to their advantage to cut the fuel costs and make air traveling even faster. Clouds, especially thunderheads, can indicate that an area of turbulence is ahead. But sometimes, clear air turbulence occurs when a plane can drop a few feet and start shaking without any warning. It happens when two bodies of air clash at very high speeds, and it's absolutely invisible, so the pilots can't tell when it would happen. The chances of getting into an area of clear air turbulence are higher at low altitudes, over mountain ranges, and near the jet streams. Normally, after it's hit by lightning, an airplane is sent for inspection right after landing, but it can still safely complete its current flight. The fuselage conducts electricity well enough, and like with a lightning rod, the zap will most probably strike one of the tips of the airplane, either one of the wings or the nose. Then it seeks the ground, but doesn't find it, exiting from the tail in the end. It's easier for electricity to roll through the surface of the plane than go inside, so people on board are safe from its effects. Still, lightning is powerful, and there can be some damage done to the airplane on the outside. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.